right, howdy. Welcome uh, to opening the black box, uh, becoming a better uh, developer through debugging. Um, let's see. My name is Dustin Yance. I'm uh, Mills Yantef pretty much everywhere. And it's a very embarrassing uh, handle that uh, I started using in 1998, and now I can't get rid of it. Yeah, uh, not enough volume. Um, There we go. Is that any better? Okay. I'll just step back a little bit. I am an engineer at Acquia. Maybe you've heard of us. Uh, we do some sort of stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm new there. Um, I'm working on internal tools, which is a, a new and interesting thing for me. Um, I'm not actually making websites. It's, uh, it's weird. So, I guess the, the big question is, what is debugging? So, I'm sure some of you have seen a page like this. You open up your Drupal site. Um, where is everything? You've got your content, obviously, um, but uh, you don't have any of your styling. You don't have any of your JavaScript. Um, so, what kind of uh, what kind of things could cause nothing but text? Um, your CSS. Maybe you have aggregation turned on, uh, but the cache is messed up. Pretty common. You clear the cache, everything's fine. Uh, maybe for some reason JS is blocked in the browser. Um, this used to not be such a big deal, uh, but now a lot, a lot more people are using JavaScript blockers as app blockers. Um, I've been using Ghostery, and I've discovered just how many websites uh, require JavaScript to work. It's pretty hilarious. Um, maybe it's file permissions. This is also a pretty common one when you're going from local to uh, production for the first time or in the reverse. Um, that's not really debugging. That's just kind of troubleshooting. That's what I would say. It's mostly a semantic difference. Um, I think if I had to uh, put you know, some kind of rule behind it, I would say, did you fix it in five minutes or five hours? Um, and really, the, the definition is, did you just fix a thing, or did you understand the issue and correct the issue so it doesn't happen again? Um, so that's where we're going to try to get into some of that. So what's this black box I'm talking about? Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, does any of this sound familiar? Uh, Non-technical education. I was a film major and a psychology major. Uh, Self-taught web skills, because uh, that's what you did. Definitely above average Googling skills. Uh, I mean, I think this is, you know, you can get a master's in Googling nowadays. And late nights, staring at error messages. This is, this is how I learned. This is, you know, how I came up in the world. Um, so, what is Drupal? I guess, you know, everybody here probably knows uh, what Drupal is. Uh, but what is it really? Uh, I think it's, it's useful to have a, kind of a mental model of what you're working on. So what's a mental model of Drupal? It's a black box um, to many people. It's just it's a thing. It sits on the server. You ask it for things. It returns things. Uh, but what's happening? You know, we don't really know. Um, maybe your mental model of Drupal is a little bit more advanced. You know that there's a light that tells you that things are working or not. Uh, so it's going to get a little bit weird. Promise, it's for a good reason. Anybody ever read this book, Maniac McGee? Uh, it's one of the, the all-time classics as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when I was in film school, this was the book I wanted to turn into a movie. And then Nickelodeon did it, and I haven't brought myself to watch it because I'm sure it's terrible. Um, so, in this book, there's a very important uh, lesson that I learned personally. Um, other than accepting others, which you know, the rest of America can maybe uh, hear this book once or twice. Um, but I learned about this. Cobbles not. Uh, so in the book, if you remember, uh, there is a, a pizza place, uh, Cobbles, uh, and out front they have a flagpole. And on this flagpole is a rope. Um, and this rope has been sitting there getting tangled up and knotted for years and years and years. It is, uh, to the mind of the children, the largest, most impenetrable knot ever in the history of the world. And there's a contest. The first person to untangle this knot gets free pizza for a year. And, you know, if you're a kid and somebody offers you pizza for a year, that's pretty amazing. Uh, one of the things about Maniac, uh, the lead character of Maniac and Gee, he's really good at knots. Um, he is the guy that all the kids go to when their shoelaces get knotted up, and he can always fix it. Um, so they say, hey, Maniac, you've got to attack this knot. It's going to be the greatest thing you've ever done in your life, and we're going to get pizza for a year. So he goes, and he, uh, he sits down. At the, there's a picnic table right by the knot. And the first thing he does, he sits down and he just stares at it. He just looks at this knot for an entire day. 
everybody, you know, they're standing around waiting for him to just untie this knot in two seconds. But he's, he knows better. He knows that this knot is, is a challenge. So he sits down and he just stares at it. The day goes by. Next day he comes back, he starts poking at it. He's not untangling anything yet. He's just kind of poking at it. He's seeing where the rope goes into the top, where it comes out of the bottom, and he's starting to find all the ins and outs throughout that knot, the big mass of the knot. And all the kids are like, what are you doing? You should just be untangling this knot. This is what you do. Uh, but he knows. He has to understand this knot. He can't just attack this knot. If he just goes after this knot, it's going to defeat him. This is a Drupal. This is a, a, a bit of a, a Drupal 7 bootstrap. Um, so somewhere up at the top is a request. Um, somewhere at the bottom is the response. There's a lot going on. Every single one of those blocks probably has another graph that looks exactly like this behind it. It's kind of a knot. Um, so you know we have to we have to start picking apart and understanding the different pieces of Drupal before we can really debug Drupal. So let's start at the beginning. The first thing when you need to attack a knot is you need tools. You need to know what your tools are. You need to get familiar with them because when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, it's really easy to get stuck in a routine. You found you found one thing that works, and you're just going to do that every single time. So you, the first time you discover Drush Cache Clear All, or even better, Drush Registry Rebuild Dash Dash Fire Bazooka, you're like, this is great. This always fixes the problem. The site's down. My boss is yelling at me. I hit this button, and it works. But you don't really know if what you did fixed it. And this is what you're always going to come back to. Uh, so it's, it's, really, it's really hard. Uh, you got to be careful that you're not just kind of, as they say, shaving yaks. Uh, it's really easy to spend a week playing with tools and nothing but playing with tools. Every once in a while you do have to do actual work, unfortunately. Um, so, first tool in everybody's tool belt is a text editor. Uh, they come in different flavors. There's text editors I put in quotes. Text editors, IDEs. Um, so what are the text editors in quotes? Uh, these are the very basic things that literally let you edit text. Notepad, text edit. Nano. Um, these are all good. Pretty much everybody starts here. Um, you know, the first time you go and you type in, you know, if you're on a Linux server, you type in edit space, the file name, it's probably going to open up a Nano. Um, these are very simple. You typically don't have uh, the nice things. You don't even have syntax highlighting. Um, but even more so, you can't add that. So these are text editors. That's what they do. That's all they do. Uh, in a pinch, they're great. Um, it's, you, know, you need to kind of level up. And that's where text editors come from. Uh, so if you're on Windows, Notepad++ is great. Uh, it's based on Notepad, but you can add plugins. And there's a ton of plugins. You can do some really good work with this. Uh, Vim, this is a whole thing. Like You can give an entire semester master class in Vim, so I won't even get into it. Check out YouTube if you really want to get deep into that rabbit hole. Uh, Dreamweaver, believe it or not, Dreamweaver is a, a pretty passable text editor. You turn off all the automated stuff. Um, I used to work at a university. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but universities are really weird about buying software. But if they already own the software, anybody can use it, typically. So I spent a good chunk of my early career just using Dreamweaver as a text editor, and it worked. Uh, Sublime Text, uh, I think everybody has probably seen that at one point or another. Um, Atom, very similar to Sublime Text. These two, uh, of the graphical text editors, these are probably the two most popular nowadays. Um, they're really awesome because they have tons of plugins. They have tons of people making stuff for them. Um, one thing that I found is it's really easy to to want to be what's the word? kind of religious about your your tools um, and say, oh well, I heard one time that this is the best tool to use, so that's what I'm always going to use. Um, and what I've learned is I don't really care what the tool is as long as other people are using it. And I mean like a lot of other people. Um, Sublime Text, uh, it almost died a couple years ago because it's one guy writing the thing. Um, and he just kind of stopped writing it. And people started going away from it. And all of a sudden, there weren't plugins, there weren't plugin updates, and it really started to languish. Um, that's when Adam came around. Um, Adam was built and released by GitHub. Um, and they're pretty popular. So they had tons of people working on it immediately. Uh, you go look at their plugins, they have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of downloads on the more popular plugins. Um, and that kind of kicks the blind text in the butt. And now they're, they're picking it up again. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really matter what the tool is as long as other people are using it. Because that's when it's going to get better. Um, and that's really the, the beauty of open source. It's the beauty of Drupal. 
Drupal is only good as long as people are using it. Um, as long as people are using the, the new hotness and working on it and contributing back to it. Next step up, IDEs. Uh, I will be 100% uh, honest. I was scared of IDEs for a very long time. Um, the first time you open up something like PHP Storm, you're like, dude, what's going on here? Like, there's all kinds of buttons and panels. You key bindings are really weird. You don't know what's going on. And even once you get, you know, you follow nine blog posts and you get it working, it feels really slow, really clumsy. <laughs> I started a new job recently. I started working at Acquia. I said, okay, this is it. I'm going to learn PHP Storm. This is the perfect time um, because nobody expects me to do anything at this job yet. It's the beauty of uh, starting a new job. You usually get at least a, a couple of weeks of, uh, of uh, leniency. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to learn PHP Storm. I almost love PHP Storm. It can do a lot of really good stuff. Uh, if you are uh, here just a minute ago and saw TED speak, um, if you're using uh, PHP Storm, Drupal becomes very transparent because PHP Storm is smart. It's intelligent about PHP. So it can tell you, oh, you want this function. You also need these uh, arguments to pass into the function. Um, it does some really cool stuff. Um, you can use uh, Eclipse. You can use uh, Komodo is another good one. Um, all of these. Uh, are really good. Um, they're not always cheap. Uh, that's, I think that's the biggest argument against PHP Storm. It costs money. Then, you know, it's a tool. Uh, if you're getting paid to do your job, uh, it probably, you know, it's in your best interest to spend a little bit of money on your tools. Um, or, you know, make your boss buy it. That's always the best way to go. Um, so, yeah, so these are great. Uh, you know, you've got, you got your plugins, you've got the ability to customize things, you've got the ability to, to start really inspecting and really see into stuff, which is it's really powerful. And then, of course, there's operating systems with built in text editors. It's an Emacs joke. Um, Emacs versus Vim, we're not even going to touch it. They're both great, they both do different things. They're both, again, an entire grad degree in and of themselves as far as complexity is concerned. Um, I just started playing with Emacs, and I think I might be in love, and that's kind of scary. But I guess falling in love always is. Um, so, you've got your tool, now you need a place to use the tool. That's your development environment. You probably started just working on your server. Uh, you logged in, you edit index.php, you start doing stuff. Uh, as you get a little bit more experience, you probably wanted to start doing things locally on your machine. Um, it tends to make things a little bit faster. Uh, it tends to make it uh, so, you, so you don't break production nearly as often. Um, I, I worked uh, at a university library, uh, and when I first uh, got there, I discovered that not only was everybody editing everything directly on the production server, which is fun, um, they're all doing it using the same username, uh, which was just terrifying. Uh, and then I taught them how to use Git, and then they just started using a single Git repository with a branch for every different code base, and that was terrifying. <sighs> Learn your tools. Uh, that still gives me nightmares. Uh, on your machine, but it acts like the server. So on your machine typically means you're using something like, uh, if you've got a Mac, you can run PHP and Apache directly on it. Uh, or maybe you step up to something like MAMP or XAMPP. Um, these are really good, the, but they can't always uh, replicate the server environment that you need. Um, so that's when you kind of step it up and you try to make it act a little bit more like the server. Um, so yeah, so as, if you're working directly on the server, it's typically like FTP development. Like maybe you're, you're doing your text editing locally and you're uploading it. Uh, I like to call this cowboy coding where I come from. Uh, that's Texas, y'all. Uh, this is bad, don't do this. Um, what happens is you do things like uh, you accidentally break the library website for, for an entire day uh, because the file got truncated. Guess what? The HD access file, you need all of it. <laughs> it's, real, it's really mad if you miss a couple characters. Uh, local environments. Uh, these include uh, MAMP, uh, a LAMP stack that you install uh, manually, or something like Vagrant. Uh, Vagrant's really cool. Uh, next generation stuff, uh, Calibox, uh, which is a Docker-based uh, virtual machine made by the fine folks at Calamina. Uh, or Drupal VM. So Drupal VM I separate from Vagrant only because it's very tailored directly to Drupal development. That's all it does. And it has a ton of amazing tools pre-built in for you. It's really great. You just start it and go. 
Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so the problems with FTP development, Cowboy coding, uh, you generally have no version control up front. Um, so this means you, you're not able to use something like Git, uh, which means that you don't know who made what change, when they made the change, and what they changed. All you know is that a file changed on a certain date and time. And again, if everybody's using the same username, uh, you don't even know who did it. That's fun. A uh, little debugging visibility. You might have access to the log files, um, not always. Uh, you can definitely drop in debug statements, like DSMs or Kents, um, but that's about all you can do. Maybe you have access to the watchdog logs. You don't even always have that. Um, I've seen you know, uh, where you have syslog instead of a watchdog, and you don't have access to the syslogs. I've been in that position, that's a real problem. Um, so the debug statements. Printr, this is one of the most basic. This is just a PHP thing. It takes whatever you put in there and it dumps it out. It's pretty ugly, but it works. Um, no formatting, but it gives you everything. And I mean everything. Sometimes that's not a good thing. If you're doing a printr of a node, you'd be surprised at how much data is involved with a single node. I think it's kind of tricky to dig through it. Uh, one just kind of quick and dirty trick I like to do, throw some pre-tags around a printr. Uh, you at least get some line breaks. That's nice. A little bit of indenting. Uh, DSM uh, in Drupal 7 or Kint in Drupal 8. Uh, these are really great for giving a formatted dump of a variable or context. Um, they're very powerful. You have to be sure, uh, particularly when you're using Kint for the first time, uh, look up, there's a lot of really great blog posts nowadays. Um, Kint doesn't work the way you think it works. Um, it gives you a lot of data and you can easily crash your browser um, if you accidentally unfurl the wrong thing in the dropdown. It's, it's kind of, it's super powerful. Um, but yeah, so you can do DSM of a node and then you get the nice uh, formatted uh, dropdowns. Um, so you can click into arrays, you can click into objects and you can see uh, the different things that are there. Um, so these are, you know, these are great tools, these are pretty powerful. That's basically all you get if you're working remotely. Um, using FTP, you don't really have server access. So, we want to do a little bit more. So, let's move it locally. So, MAMP, Dev Desktop from Acquia, uh, Native LAMP. Um, these are great um, because they, they finally let you uh, do things like use Xdebug. We're going to get into what Xdebug is in just a sec. Um, all of the code is running locally. And as an added bonus, uh, you don't need internet to work. Um, this is really nice. Uh, if, uh, like me, in the past, you've worked at an agency where they have very unrealistic expectations of your time, and you have to get six hours of work done on a flight from New York to LA. Uh, being able to work without an internet connection is uh, very useful. Um, so you get access to all of the, the standard uh, outputs, but you also get access to Xdebug. Um, so Xdebug is uh, what they call a, a step-through debugging method for PHP. Uh, it is really great. Um, it's really weird at first, and it can be hard to configure depending on your environment. Um, this is another place where PHP Storm is fantastic because it knows about Xdebug and it makes it really simple to get it working the first time. Um, it's possible to set this up inside of Atom or Sublime Text. I've done both, um, but it tends to be a little bit more fragile. Uh, you can do really great stuff with Xdebug and Vim and Emacs because there's really great plugins for that. Um, so let's see. Is this? Yeah. So I'm going to do something that I never, I never do. Still like demo. Um, so I don't trust myself with uh, Xdebug at the moment. So we're going to do a little bit of a demo using uh, some JavaScript. So if you didn't know, Google Chrome has some of the best developer tools ever made built into it. One of the things it has is a step through JavaScript debugger built in. So this is the same premise as Xdebug. Um, but it is in JavaScript. And this is just hanging out in your browser. You may not have even known it was there, but you can do some really cool stuff. So what we are going to do is, we are going to discover uh, da, 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 da. the answer. Everybody wants to know the answer, so let's figure out what this answer is. Right now, it's a, it's a big question mark. Um, so, we've got some code here. This is gonna help us figure out the answer. Um, but currently, as you saw, we don't, we don't have an answer. It's, it's still giving us question marks. Uh, so the first thing, uh, is there an error message? It's absolutely an error message. It's saying that it can't read the property parent node of null, 
what does that mean? Like, I mean, it's right there, right? Just look at the code. Um, so, I mean, the JS, I think, you know, it's, it's, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just finding a parent node. Like, what, what should be so hard about that? Um, so now we have to step up. So instead of looking at our template, let's go look, uh, let's look in actual Drupal code. You know, let's look inside of um, the module instead of inside of the theme layer. Um, or I guess it's kind of reverse. Um, but yeah, so we have uh, just very basic HTML. Um, so we have a script tag, we have a link tag for the CSS, um, and then we have a place for the answer. It seems like it should be pretty straightforward. Um, but what I didn't realize is uh, it matters where you load the JavaScript, obviously. Uh, you load the JavaScript before the HTML, the, the JavaScript doesn't necessarily know about the HTML. Pretty easy fix. So we're going to take this. And there we go. So now, oh, we got something. This doesn't seem right, does it? It seems, I don't know, it's just, I mean, obviously, you know, who am I to say what the answer is? It seems, it seems a little bit wrong. Um, so if we look back at the logic over here, so we're looping, you know? So we know uh, we're going to start with the iterator at zero, we're going to do a couple of loops, the answer is going to start off at zero, and then we're going to add seven to the answer, because seven is a, it's a pretty magical number if you didn't know. Uh, it works into a lot of things. Um, so let's we'll just loop it by seven. Um, so something is obviously off here. Um, so let's do some, some debug statements. Um, so now when we run this, we're going to see, uh, have fingers, Now, as we run this, we're going to see some output. So now we know that uh, the answer total came out to 14 at this step. Um, but now we can go back in time. So the very first time it ran, the very first loop, it had two loops. And the total was 7. Okay, so our math is working, because 0 plus 7, double check me, I'm pretty sure it's 7. So the math is working. We know it's not some kind of like weird math thing. That's good. The second loop. Answer total is 14. Okay, so 7 plus 7 is 14. So the math is still working out. So there's got to be something else that's wrong here. Um, so, you know, maybe we're not doing enough loops. That's what we need. Um, let's try it. Uh, let's change it to here. So this is all like really kind of basic, straightforward. Nothing really, nothing really cool here. Um, now our answer is 63. That's still, that's still it, right. That seems really wrong. Um, but let's let's take a look at what's happening. Um, so inside of our loop, we want to check what the answer is before we add seven to it. So we're going to do it's called breakpoint. Um, so breakpoint is where the debugger is going to stop. And so what's really cool about this is you're literally pausing time, like your application is running, and then you slam on the brakes. You're doing Zach Morris freeze frame. And you get to see exactly what's going on in your entire stack. Um, so we made that. Now we're going to do that. And so now it says we have paused on a breakpoint. Uh, we are right here. We're on the iterator step. So if we look inside of our global, and so this is, this is JavaScript specific uh, terminology, but that's OK. Uh, it's, all, it's all basically the same. Uh, so we have our answer here. Our answer is currently 0 in the first loop. Um, and our iterator, i is at 0. OK, so it hasn't even added that one yet. Like, this step has not occurred yet. That's pretty cool. So now we're going to play until the next time around. And we're going to go back into global. And we can see the answer is now 7. Um, and we go down, and our iterator is at 1. OK, so we made it through an entire loop, but we're stuck before the second one happens. Um, but you know, I just realized I don't think that 9 is going to work. Uh, can we do something about that? How about we go down, we find the loops, and let's just change that. So we're editing the JavaScript code that's frozen, and that's going to do stuff based on what we changed. Um, so now we are just going to step over, so it will go through all of its loops. Uh, oh wait, no, don't do that. There we go. So we're going to loop through, and now we're done. And hey, it didn't work. Why aren't you working? Oh well. So what happens when you do it live? Now the joke is ruined. Did 
And I still get it wrong. It was fantastic. Um, oh, oh, that's why you don't do left demos. Um, so the answer is not 49. The answer is 42. Um, but so what you're seeing is you're seeing the, the actual stepping through of the code as it's being executed. You're able to, uh, this is much more powerful when you're doing it in an actual application, when you're doing it in Drupal. Say you have a thing where um, a user is not able to see content they're supposed to see, and you're thinking, well, maybe it has something to do with their role. You can set a breakpoint, and you can go in and edit the role of the user who's accessing the page live. And you can see that it actually works. You haven't touched your code, you haven't put you know, extra stuff into your code that you might accidentally forget to take out. Um, you just know that, that is the actual issue. It's pretty cool when it works. And that is one of the benefits of what we'll build. Um, so, next gen. Um, these include uh, Calibox. Uh, this is really great. It's, uh, it's, it's based on Docker instead of being based on Vagrant, um, which makes things a little bit lighter weight, as well as gives you even more power to fully uh, replicate your server environment. Uh, they've been working with both Pantheon and Acquia um, to make integrations so it's even more exactly like it should be in production. Uh, Drupal VM. There's a couple of other custom Vagrant boxes, um, but it seems like people are kind of converging on Drupal VM. Um, like I said, I don't care what tool I use as long as other people are using it. Tons of people are using Drupal VM. It's moving really fast. And it's great. Um, so with this, you're able to you know, not only have a, a replica of your production environment, but you're able to easily install your debugging stuff like xDebug. Um, you can do, uh, we'll get into some of the, the profiling stuff later, like xhprof, uh, but all of that, you just like literally edit a single line in the config file, rebuild, and you've got it. Um, you're not having to dig around inside of Linux, uh, which while well, I find that fun, not everybody does. Um, so when you're doing this, again, you have access to all of your debugs. Um, you have access to a very accurate performance profiling. So not every problem uh, is like a functional problem. Sometimes stuff just takes too long. That, that can be a problem. Um, when I was working uh, at an agency, uh, we had a client on Pantheon, um, and we were doing some incredibly large imports using feeds uh, as a cron job. And it was getting to the point where the cron job was taking too long, and it was being cut off because Pantheon had a limit on how long a cron job could run, because otherwise, you know, it really hurt some stuff. Um, so using something like XHProf, or this new ones, uh, Blackfire and Tidewater, I haven't used those yet, uh, but XHProf is really rad. But these give you uh, kind of stopwatches on every single thing that happens when you load a page. Um, so you're able to see that, oh, it spent, you know, 500 milliseconds just doing these nine database calls. Um, so you can say, is there anything we can do to those database calls to make them a little bit faster? Um, you can see that, oh, this function that we used is taking 700 milliseconds, and we expect it to take 70 milliseconds, so what's going on there? And then you can go in and maybe realize, oh, you're looping more times than you thought you were looping to get a thing done. Um, so these are really great. Um, you can use these things inside of uh, like, uh, just regular Vagrant boxes, but again, these are all like, literally out of the box. Tidewater was just added last week or two weeks ago to Drupal VM. Um, you basically just check a box and you have it. That's really rad, really powerful. Um, okay, so uh, I kind of skipped ahead to next debug. So step through debugging, uh, as I said, it's hitting the pause button. You're able to inspect the current state of the stack. Um, this is one of those terms that people throw around and expect you to know what it means. Um, it's basically just as you're doing stuff, uh, as PHP is executing, it's going in and out of files. It's going through that flow chart that we showed. And every time, it's kind of accumulating another layer of stuff. And that, those layers are the stack. Um, and so by doing that, you can see exactly what files um, are being called. Um, one of the things I did when I first started playing around with xDebug uh, was I just set it to uh, pause at every step. And I just went one by one. Because I was curious, like where, you know, if you hit refresh and you're loading a page, like where does Drupal go? Uh, it turns out it goes to a lot of places, and it goes to a lot of them many times. Um, that's fun, uh, but yeah, that's what it takes to, to make a web page. You have to you have to go to the database for this. You have to go to the database for this. You have to go to this render array to do this thing, but you have to do it seven times. Um, you have to drop in your menu stuff a bunch, um, and every step along the way, you can watch it, um, you can pause it, you can modify it, you can do some really cool stuff. Um, modifying values live, which obviously I failed at, but that's okay. Uh, you can do it, I promise. 
So, we talked about some tools. Let's actually let's talk about some problems. Um, so I spent a couple of years running a support department, which means that everything was always broken all the time. Like I would walk into work and I would spend the day fixing broken stuff, um, which isn't as fun as it sounds. Um, and <laughs> the problem about things being broken is your clients are always like Kermit. <laughs> Because to them, every single problem is the worst problem. And to you, you've got 20 clients with these <laughs> with problems. Um, so the first thing you have to learn how to do is relax. Um, before support, I also, when I was in college, I did five years working telephone tech support, um, helping people in rural, rural areas uh, get connected to dial-up and DSL. Um, and that's where I learned about this. Um, it's, you know, the human body is weird, the human brain is weird. We are wired to be terrified, which is kind of a funny thing, because that's how you survive in the wild. Um, if you're, you know, there's a tiger over there, I should probably run. Uh, and that's, you know, that's how our brains are, are put together. So you have to actively work against that. Otherwise, you are gonna always be in a panic mode. And you're gonna, it's, it's no fun. It's stressful, you can get sick. Um, so you just gotta learn, take a deep breath, and relax. Uh, is anybody in here working on, uh, I don't know, nuclear stuff? Okay, cool. Then you don't have to worry. Like, nothing that you do to any of the websites you work on is the worst thing in the world. Um, even if you work for, out of the stock exchange, um, some rich people are going to lose some money, they'll get it back. It's okay. It's literally not the end of the world. Remember the knot. Getting angry at the knot isn't going to untangle the knot. Getting frustrated with it, cursing at it, what curse at it, that's fine. That's, that's pretty healthy. Um, but, you know, getting mad at it isn't going to help. The knot is always going to be the knot. So you have to just relax, focus on the problem. The first question is what's broken? Um, you know, the client will come to you, the customer will come to you and say, oh, the site's broken. That's usually their, their trouble report. The site's broken. Okay, well, We've got 9,000 pages. Which specific one is broken? Like, what is wrong? What is broken? Is something not showing up? You know, did you publish a new article and it's not showing up on the, on the front page? Um, if it's new, is it actually published? Or did you just hit save or preview without setting it to publish? If it's old content, are the permissions set properly? Uh, is there something wrong with the URL? Maybe some paths got rewritten and now they're broken. There's something showing up that shouldn't. You know, maybe uh, you know, content that somebody shouldn't have access to, um, particularly if you're working on something like maybe behind a paywall, um, and all of a sudden people have free access to all the content. That's not great. Um, maybe it's a raw HTML and JavaScript showing up because somebody pasted it into a WYSIWYG field. Uh, it's, not current, it's not correctly being escaped. Um, so we need to find out actually what's broken. To do that, let's work from the bottom up. So again, your first instinct is probably going to be, let's clear cache. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but every time it works, you really have lost all the evidence of what was wrong. Um, so if you can, let's not do that for a sec. Uh, first thing, let's look at the log files. Um, you should always learn how to find the log files before you need your log files. Um, I do this really weird thing where when I stay in a hotel, uh, the first thing I do is I walk through the entire hotel. Because I want to know where the doors are. I want to know how am I going to get out of here if something goes wrong. Um, do the same thing when you take over a website. You know, spend a half day just where are the log files. I need to know that. Um, do I have access to the log files? Because just because you know where they are doesn't mean that you have the permissions to read them. And you know, that's a crappy thing to learn when you're in an emergency. Uh, so take a, take a minute, walk around. Um, I really love this tool, Multitail. Uh, it's a, a Linux Mac. Uh, command line utility. Uh, it lets you view the logs with a few more options. Uh, one of the really great things it lets you do is view multiple logs on a single stream. Um, so if you ever wanted your computer to look like a hacker from a TV show, this is the app for you. Um, you can color code it, you can do custom formatting, you can do some really cool stuff using Multitail. Um, so this is really great because you can uh, combine, say, you know, it's one thing to look at the PHP error log. Um, 
but maybe it's just sitting there doing nothing. And you don't know that because you're not also looking at the Apache access log. So with this, you can put both of those together. You can view them both at once, and when something comes in, you'll see two things correlated. So you'll see that, oh, if somebody goes to this path in the Apache access file, it returns this error in the PHP error log. And you can visually see that, and that's really cool. Um, where is it broken? Um, so hopefully by now we know what is broken, but we still need to find out where. Uh, there's a lot of layers, a lot of places it can go wrong. Was it a custom module? This is you know, pretty common. Uh, you're working on something, maybe you didn't expect uh, an, out an outcome. Um, you know, you didn't have, you're doing a nested if-else statement, um, and you missed one of the combinations. Um, this happened to me once. I will, I will show you. One of my all-time greatest tools is a notebook. I know, I'm weird, I'm old, I like to write things down. Uh, but one time, I was working on a problem, and I made this chart. Um, and so all I did was, it's a very simple um, chart, and I said, okay, what are my variables? What states can those variables be in? And which of those have I covered using these if-else statements? Uh, so this is somebody else's code. I didn't really know it very well. Uh, and I, saw, I just went through. And you know, if it met the criteria, I put a check mark. If it didn't, I put an, uh, an X. And I was able to see that, oh, there were two entire conditions that had nothing happening with them. So if it got to that point, it would just kind of dump out. Um, and this was for a learning management system. So dumping out meant that the student couldn't finish what they were doing. Um, it's not a great thing. And it's, you know, it was a custom module um, that was written by a single person uh, without a lot of uh, code review, which is never a good thing. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty easy to miss these things because you have expectations of what your code should do. And you don't always remember that there are other things that could happen. There are other ways people could, you know, not even the, the malicious stuff, but it could just be that, uh, you know, in this one case, the points um, that were accumulating, the math wasn't being done right. Um, so it would add, 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 subtract everything. And how did it subtract everything? So you sit down, you work it out, take the time, figure it out. Um, maybe uh, it's in the template layer. You know, maybe it's in one of your, your template files. Uh, maybe it's in your, your theme file. Uh, maybe it's you know, uh, in, in one of the actual, like a, a blocked uh, template file somewhere. Um, so this is a great place to, you know, debug statements are really good for this. Um, you can go in and you can say, well, I'm pretty sure that it's this template file. Um, so let me see, you know, you can do, I like to do before and after uh, logic, I output the variable. That way I can see what happens to that variable in that little bit of logic. It's a very simple thing to do. Xdebug works really great for this. Um, I know, the site's down. Like, everything's on fire. Everybody's mad at you, everybody's yelling at you. Why are you relaxing so much? <laughs> it's cool, man, we gotta, we gotta relax. Um, scientific method. This is uh, one of those things that everybody learns in school and then immediately forgets. And it's one of the most important things in the world. You need to slow down, do things methodically. Change one thing at a time. This is probably the hardest. Uh, once you start digging into a problem, you start seeing places where it might be wrong, and you want to start changing them all at once. And hey, maybe that works. But which one fixed it? Do you know? Probably not. So do one thing at a time, test that change. Repeat that over and over again. Again, it's slow, but it's important. Git is your friend particularly in this instance. Um, save your progress as you work. So every time you make a change that has a positive outcome, make a git commit. If you, even if you wind up with 30 git commits, you can squash them later, it's okay. Um, but what you're able to see is, as you're working, these are the things I changed. This is what I changed it, and this was the outcome. And that's really great. Um, it's also really great if you're using something like uh, features or uh, config YAML files, because uh, you can see that, oh, since the last time I dumped all of these files to Git, somebody changed these nine things on the production site. And you can see that, oh, they added a role. They added a permission to this other role. And you can visually see that difference. If you're not using features, if you're not using config management, you definitely should. Uh, it's a little bit weird. The workflows can be a little bit uh, strange at first, but it's so worth it in the long run. They help, uh, it helps make the rabbit holes more manageable. You're not just, you know, 
diving headfirst into a black hole of code. Um, you're kind of methodically, you know, one layer at a time, like you're an archaeologist, just one layer at a time. Uh, get bisect as your friend. Um, this is uh, kind of kind of new to me, and I really like it. Uh, so this is a command built into Git where you can give it two points in time, like the current and three commits ago, and it will start bisecting the code, which means it splits it in half and it tests each side. It lets you isolate changes between the commits, um, and this is super nice. Um, there's a book that I will be mentioning at the end of this where I found this really great graph, this really great image. So imagine you are in a factory, and this factory is taking existing teddy bears and turning them into Christmas teddy bears. And you stick it on the conveyor belt, it goes along with the conveyor belt, it comes out the other end, that doesn't look like a Christmas teddy bear. It looks like a, like a pile of, of not great. Um, we have all of these places along the way. There's 40, in this example, there's 45 different places where this could be going wrong. Um, turns out, mathematically, the best place to start is always in the middle. Um, you are cutting down the number of places that you have to check. Because now you can tell if it's something before the middle or something after the middle that's causing the problem. Um, and then you can work from there. You can keep bisecting and keep bisecting, and then you find the actual problem. Um, get diff is your friend. Uh, after you make all of your changes, um, you need to remove your debug statements. Uh, I've, I've forgotten to do this a couple times. Um, you need to ensure that you change only as much as you actually needed to change. Uh, it's really common, you know, especially with Drupal 8, you can have 19 files open for one very simple thing. Uh, you can change something in one of these files and completely forget about it. Um, but if you do the git diff and you actually read through the git diff before you commit it, you can see exactly what you changed. And that's really nice. Uh, we only do this one time. <laughs> You're, uh, you really get called out by your, by your uh, superiors for that one. Then you start using a different word for debugging. Well, it turns out the clients have access to the Git repo. That's not great. Git blame is another command you can use to find your enemies. No, I'm not using it to find your enemies. It's your friend. Um, so git blame uh, is what lets you see who did what to every single line of code most recently. Um, so you can quickly tell Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get real mad at Oscar because he did this stupid thing over here. You don't have it. It's, you know, you just need to know who did a thing, and for all you know, they did it for a very good reason. You know, uh, very very rarely do people actually, uh, in good faith, do things badly. Um, they're generally trying to do the right thing, uh, at least at the time. So don't let it be a witch hunt. That's bad. Um, but it is a time to find uh, context for the issue. Um, so again, with the, the example uh, with the learning management system, I talked to the original developer, and he was like, oh, well, when I first wrote this code, it was only supposed to allow for these certain things. And then, of course, the client changed this, changed that, and changed this, and changed that. Um, and he didn't have the, the chance to go back and like rework the whole thing. So you know, it's not that he did anything wrong. It's just that errors accumulate. And I needed to know the context for what happened. You can also call it git annotate. That's probably a nicer, nicer term for it. It's alias to, to blame. So, other debugging methods. Um, so most of the time, uh, I'm, I'm working in code that somebody else wrote. Um, this has been true of my support jobs. This is true of my current job. Um, I'm mostly modifying stuff, changing stuff, making it, making it a little bit different. Uh, and that, that can be frustrating. That can be really frustrating. Uh, it's bad enough when it's your own code and you know, you, you kind of know what, why you did a thing, uh, but sometimes you get really frustrated. This is a very valid debugging technique, believe it or not. Um, one, of my, one of my former coworkers, uh, he, he used to like to say that, hey man, if it's in my head, it's billable. Uh, he, would, he would take walks all the time to figure out stuff. Um, but you know, sometimes you need to walk away. You need to you know, get your head off of that screen. Um, maybe it's going from the screen to a piece of paper and just kind of working out pseudocode what should be happening. Um, maybe it's taking your dog for a walk. Um, whatever it is, you know, get your mind out of the current rut that it's in and let it start background processing some stuff. That's really great. Um, talk to a coworker. 
this is all, always really good. Uh, it gets a little bit weird nowadays because everybody's working remotely. Uh, I spent a couple of years doing a, a fully remote job. Um, but you know, sometimes you need to. Or you need to talk to a rubber duck. Has anybody heard the term rubber duck debugging? Uh, so this is really great. The idea is you can literally talk to any inanimate object and if you explain the problem from the beginning, you'd be surprised how many times by the time you get to the end you figure out what you did wrong. Uh, I used to do this with my cat all the time. What if the rubber duck has questions? Well, if the rubber duck has questions, you've got a bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, my, my cat was a, she was brutal. She, she always called me a dummy. Um, so yeah, write it down by hand. Um, there, there is a very, a very real difference uh, to your brain between typing and writing. Um, there are two very different activities in your brain. Um, so this can help, you know, kind of activate different pathways, which is always really good. Uh, write down, you know, it can be real code, it can be pseudo code, you can just make charts, uh, whatever it is that helps you. Um, and, of course, hey, let's make the future a little bit easier for ourselves and for others. Um, so let's do some proactive debugging. Every time you find a problem that doesn't have watchdog log output, or indeed Drupal Logger output, write it. Um, you know, we do this in my current job. Uh, we, we have uh, so many watchdog logs being written every single minute. It's really great. Uh, because stuff's gonna go wrong. Like, that's just the way things are. And most core code is going to log those errors. But most custom code usually doesn't. Um, so take the time, every time you find a, a specific instance where something goes wrong, just write a little bit of debug so you can, at the very least, count how many times that happens. Um, when you're working, you know, we work on a pretty big project. Uh, we have our, our Jira board is a nightmare. Um, so we can't work on every single problem. Like that, it just literally isn't manageable. Um, so we can say, we found this problem once. We wrote some, some debug output. We're gonna see how many times it happens in the next week, or the next month. And if it only happens once a month, you know, we're, we're doing hundreds of thousands of transactions a day. We're pretty okay with that. Um, that's, that's a rounding error at that point. Um, so that's, you know, it's good to collect that data so you can have, have that in mind. Um, I'm a big fan of using the syslog module. Um, so, yes? So I'm, I'm a bit confused by this watchdog mm -hmm. idea. In a production system, you're going to be writing a lot of watchdog entries, which is going to make your watchdog table just very cluttered mm -hmm. and hide other stuff that you might want to find. Yep. So... I would, I would have thought that writing watchdog statements was like, watching, like writing print statements. Like a bad idea. It all depends on where they're going. So that's what syslog is for. Um, so syslog, instead of writing to your database, it writes that exact same information to the syslog location on the server. Okay. Um, so it's way faster. Um, and you can do some really cool stuff like output that to Logly, or a bulk stack, as they call it, or we use sumo logic. Um, so these are third-party services that collect all of your logs and just have them available to you. And then let you search against them, make reports against them. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's a, that's a very good point that you, just doing watchdog logs to the database can definitely slow things down, definitely fill up your database pretty quick. Um, that's where syslog comes up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is using you know, standard uh, Unix Linux style logging, uh, which is super, super fast. Um, and lets you do really cool stuff. Uh, I am a super fan of Sumo Logic right now. Um, Can you output the log to another log location besides the syslog? Yeah, so it uh, depends. Uh, so the question was, can you uh, output syslog to a different location? Uh, and it depends on your server. Um, so, some, like, so if you're on Pantheon, um, not really. Um, but you can still take that and port it out to one of these services. If you run the server, you can absolutely define where it's going to go. But yeah, that, that all depends on your service situation. Um, we're at a test. This is something I'm new to. Uh, it's still kind of weird. Uh, still don't entirely understand it. Um, but we're at a test. If you run into a problem um, and you think you have fixed it, prove it. Uh, write a test that uses the problem uh, that you found and make sure that your code actually passes it every single time. Um, so we are we're still using a Drupal 7 stack, so we're still using simple test. Um, if you're on Drupal 8, you'll be using a PHP unit, which is a bit better. Um, or if it's something on the front end, you can do behavioral testing like behavior testing. Um, so if it's a thing where, say, uh, somebody has access to uh, content they're not supposed to have, 
um, a BHAT test is really great because you can, in the BHAT test, generate an anonymous user, have that anonymous user visit a piece of content they should not be able to see, and determine if it's actually on the screen or not. Um, so BHAT is, it can be tied into uh, actual visual testing, or it can just kind of work in a headless browser, as they call it. Uh, but this is a really great way. Uh, it's a very, it's a very mid-cost, high-coverage way to test your site. Um, with simple test or PHP unit, you're typically unit testing individual chunks of logic, uh, which is super great. Uh, but it takes time, um, and you know, again, it doesn't always cover the edge cases as well because you're isolating things very, very granularly. Um, so BHAT is really great. So yeah, so you run into the problem, write a test. Make, make life easier for everybody. Uh, so, so from further reading, um, a couple books, The Art of Troubleshooting. Uh, this is a fantastic book. Uh, this is where the, uh, the teddy bear example came from. Uh, it is available as a free uh, PDF download at art of, artoftroubleshooting.com slash book. Um, it's really great. It's, it, it's a very general uh, troubleshooting book. It, it's not Drupal specific, it's not PHP specific. Um, it has a lot of teddy bear uh, factory examples. Um, but it gives you just kind of a holistic look at how to troubleshoot things. Um, another uh, great one is debugging, the nine indispensable rules for finding even the most elusive software and hardware problems. Um, this was recommended to me by Rob Ristroff, uh, who is a, uh, I guess, at least now a coworker. Um, but we gave a, a version of this talk at Sand Camp last year, and he introduced me to this book. Uh, and it's also really great. It's a bit more um, engineering, I would say, than the art of troubleshooting is. Um, Art of Troubleshooting is very, uh, is very conversational, um, but it is super great. Uh, and it's a bit more uh, kind of software engineering related. And of course, Maniac McGee is the greatest. Everybody should read it. It's just the best. Um, so, move now for a sec. Thanks, guys. Questions? More stories? That's me. Yes. So the, for the audience, uh, the, the comment was, uh, if you're doing print, uh, the print R style uh, debugging output, uh, but you still want to have a visually clean uh, site in the browser, uh, instead of using uh, those statements in the code, uh, have them output to e email, so it comes directly to you. Um, if you're using something uh, like uh, Drupal VM actually has an uh, email, uh, email catcher called MailHog built into it, so you can have a tab open and that email hits you instantly. Um, which is really great. So that's a, that's a good one. Yes? So my point uh, if you put a uh, drop as a message, drop as a message, yeah, you, I, I, yeah, you can put it at the top of the screen and get it going to the other I, yeah, yeah, I know about Google set message. I'm about to go if you're doing coding other than Google. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it's, it's a, so the, the statement was uh, you can use a DSM Drupal set message um, to, to place it somewhere on the screen in a, a neat and tidy way. This is also a great way, a great place to use uh, the regions in your Drupal team. Um, so, you know, if you need the top of the screen to look good for a client while you're working on something, uh, maybe drop your, your DPM block down into the footer. Um, so everything happens at the bottom of the page uh, where nobody ever looks anywhere. So, yes. Any other questions? Any other war stories? P PTSD out there? All right, everybody's happy, that's good. Well, thank you all very much. I hope I made you all a little bit smarter. Have a good day. From the university, they think